In Edinburgh, there's something very odd about the way the routes are disconnected in and through the city centre. It's an extraordinary bit of planning. Some of Edinburgh's routes are really excellent, many on disused railway lines or following river valleys. But riding along Prince's Street is a good deal worse than it was in the 1950s when I first did it. Now have a look at the Innocent Railway cycle route. This is the point at which an excellent commuter route reaches the city centre. I'm sorry if the cyclist was killed. In Cambridge, there are some awful routes above and some great routes below. The ambition of the Greenways plan is terrific. It's an area-wide network and it's been funded at just about the same level per head as TfL are providing in London. That's super. But in a lecture to the Cambridge Greenways group, I had to say that I'd come from hell and expected to find myself in cycling heaven, but it was only purgatory. I made four critical points. First, it's too much like a tube network, planned for commuter use and ignoring leisure use. Two, it lacks the circular connections between the radial routes which a leaf or a spider's web would have. Three, so far there's no evidence of context-sensitive design. Look at Senate House Passage. The upper photo shows how it is, and the Photoshop image below shows how they plan to adapt it for additional cycle traffic. They also want more cyclists travelling through Sheep's Green, which could easily spoil it. The underlying point is that a standard design approach is wrong. There should be a landscape design for each cycleway. Now we come to London, which at least offers a diverse range of cycling experiences. Here's a history of London cycle planning at Tour de France speed. It's a sad story. The London Cycling Campaign and Greater London Council planned the 1981 London Cycle Network, LCN. It was institutionally opposed to segregated cycle lanes at that time, so the money was spent on useless signposting and useless maps. This is a typical scene on London Cycle Network, Route 2. Even with a map and compass and signs, the routes are unfollowable. You have to know them to find them. From the map, it looks as though the LCN was based on direct links between origins and destinations. It wasn't. As the red line shows, it was a backstreet operation, fairly described as a complete fraud, not an A to B connection. On my first attempt, I got lost six times and fell off my bike once on a slippery corner. When the network was on main streets, like the A2, there were no facilities except signposts for cyclists. Nobody should ever have recommended this as a cycle route. I think that doing so was, and is, professional negligence. The photo was taken in 2018. The next plan was LCN Plus, in 2002. It was no better, and there was less of it. LCN Minus would have been a better name. Next up was Phase 1 of the Boris Superhighways. They were great for the manufacturers of blue paint, but not for cyclists. Great graphics, too. The arrows on the map make it look as though the routes went to the edge of London, which was not the plan. The next stage was phase two of the Boris Superhighway programme, and it really was great by UK standards. 
It's bikeable and respectably well designed. We must thank Boris for it, whatever else you may have to say about him. But the name was Hype, and nothing was done for ecological, hydrological or scenic values. The gold standard section on the embankment owes its scenic quality to the water and the trees, which may have been planted by Basil Jett's landscape gardener. Alexander Mackenzie designed the embankment gardens. This is the dictionary definition of a superhighway. I used to argue for the name Velaways to apply to the UK, but since we're leaving the EU, we better call them cycleways. Way is a useful component of the name. It means a track prepared or available for travelling along different to a route. Next is Boris Johnson's quiet way network. It was an unhappy compromise between a commuter route and a leisure route. Many of them were old LCN routes, so we could call it LCN plus minus, minus because of its very limited extent. It was a backstreet operation. They're well worth building, but they're not strategic infrastructure. You wouldn't take your child here on a Sunday afternoon, and nor would you use it for getting to central London on a Monday morning. Their merits are very local, and they should be planned as what TfL calls Mini Hollands. Perhaps they should get Mini Dutchmen to plan them, or Maxi Dutchmen, since it's difficult to persuade the local councils. TfL staff if not its board members, are now in favour of cycling, but many borough councils are not. Well, I now come to my first cautious step towards planning a cycleway network for East Central London, which is my local area. It's based on the system of ribs for commuter use and loops for leisure use and as feeders. So the components of the network are three origin destination superhighways in blue, but called cycleways, and numbered like roads, so that the A200 is flanked by the C200 and the A2 by the C2. An alternative route for CS4 through Southwark Park. Cyclists appreciate quiet green space. A better location for the Brunel Bridge and an Isle of Dogs superhighway, which is much needed. Two scenic leisure cycleways, one on each bank of the Thames. And a redesign of Greenwich Town Centre, as the cycling hub it is, for both leisure and commuting. So that's the proposal. Now I'll explain the design method and then the principles on which it's based. The first thing I did was to look for a map of existing cycle facilities. Here are four candidates. Top right is the TfL map. It's a fictional work because what it shows is routes that have been signposted. It doesn't show cycle facilities, like cycle lanes or cycle paths or cycle ways. It's a map of routes that were suggested 20 years ago. Cyclists now look to apps, not maps, for this type of data. The Sustrans map, lower right, shows the routes it has been involved in planning. But cyclists aren't much interested in who planned routes. They want to know about their quality and their characteristics. The open cycle map, bottom left, has the best data. It's produced by volunteers, and it's open source, and it's the best. But it shows routes, not facilities. Finally, top left, we have the Strava Metro map. It shows the journeys, not the routes, of those who use its app. The data is said to come from sweaty young men with mobile phones wearing lycra. But my impression 
is that it's an accurate representation of cycle movements in East London and therefore of where facilities should be provided. I wish TfL had an app with sufficiently good information to encourage its use by more cyclists. It would save them buying data from Strava. This is an analysis of Quietway 1 to show what should have been mapped. The official map is in purple. Below it is my survey data. It marks the dangerous junctions with red lines and shows the actual cycle facilities in blue if they're fully segregated, in green if they're shared with pedestrians, and in black if they're shared with cars. The 2017 New London Plan has too much talk about encouraging cycling and no costed plans for building cycleways. We don't need to be encouraged. We need to be helped with infrastructure. After collecting what survey data I could find, the next thing I did was to cycle the routes and, as cyclists do, to make videos of them. I think everyone working on cycle planning should do this as the first thing. Then I did my own assessments and put the videos on YouTube with an Amazon-style assessment facility called Scram and based on the Crow assessment system, which is Dutch and widely admired. Simplicity is a virtue and TFLs cycling level of service system is too complicated. My impression is that few people are using it. But as every landscape architect knows, you have to do an assessment before you can do a plan. An advantage of the Amazon style stars is that even members of the public can understand it and use it. I've put the facility with videos of the routes I surveyed on the LAA website. After doing the survey assessment and proposals I've already shown you, I did some diagrams to illustrate the principles underlying the plan. The first principle was to connect origins to destinations, always providing the shortest A to B connection for long distance commuting business trips. TfL has started doing this. And since it's the basic principle of all transport planning, you have to wonder why London didn't start doing it 50 years ago. Was the aim to get cyclists out of the way of motorists? Surely not. TfL began using an analysis of cycling potential from 2016 and published a strategic cycling analysis in 2017. I agree with Andrew Gilligan that it's plain common sense and not worth the money. What they discovered is that cyclists want to use TfL's strategic road network to get from main origins to main destinations. Well, of course they do. Then, since destinations can be local as well as strategic, we need safe routes to school and safe routes to the station, the shops, the parks, the hospital, and everywhere else. I favour a leaf and branch cycle network with local routes to local destinations. The third principle was to plan for leisure trips as well as business trips. Cycle commuting has reached 42% in Cambridge and is even heading for 2.5% in London. The number of leisure trips is higher than the number of business trips. It's two-thirds of cycle use in the UK. So I have every confidence that TfL will start planning leisure routes. In about 50 years' time? Circular routes are very well suited to leisure use, as we saw in northern France. In London, you can see this with CS3, and what I call the Royal Parks Greenway and the Queen's Walk Greenway. They form a figure of eight pattern 
and thus several loops, which are great for taking the kids on a day's cycling. The third principle is that London should, where possible, plan greenways instead of cycleways. There are many historic greenway types, so I don't think we should use the term greenway, as Sustrans do, for rural routes only. Sustrans calls urban cycleways promenades, but a promenade is a leisurely walk, especially taken in a public place to be seen by others. Sustrans also talk about green streets for cycling, but street is too often used for roads not designed for cyclists, which is what Mayor Khan is planning for Oxford Street. I favour use of the term green way in the sense of routes that are good from an environmental point of view, i.e. they should be multi-objective projects instead of single objective projects. This argument is similar to Merrick's argument that we want to see homes, not just houses, to support the health and well-being of everyone. The fourth principle is that cycleways should be related to as many thematic GIS layers as are relevant, some using survey data about the past and some using imaginative plans for the future. I've done some cartoon-style examples to show how this might work out. The first example is that cycleway planning should be related to a habitat creation policy, because we all want more wildlife in cities, and having habitats besides cycleways would be delightful. This is being done on a short section of Q1, near the Den in South London. A second example is that cycleway planning should be related to a sustainable drainage policy because cycleways can make a valuable contribution to surface water management and it will help in funding future cycleways. The third example is that cycleway planning should also relate to design ideas, to an imagined new future. Wouldn't it be great if Abercrombie's open space plan of 1943, top right, had led to the making of the green corridor he showed along the A200. TfL could then build the proposed Cycle Superhighway 4 along it. The modern equivalent of Abercrombie is, of course, the all-London green grid, though its cycle proposals are from the London Cycleway Network, and therefore wrong. There are good things about the green grid, but this one is too muddled. There's little more reason to interlink parks than to interlink libraries, cinemas or hospitals. Being in one of them is usually enough. The fourth example is that cycleway planning should relate to the social and cultural context. This is Abercrombie's social and functional analysis drawing. Everyone likes it, but I don't know of anyone finding a good use for it, yet. The 2011 census collected a lot of data about London's ethnicity. We've got a Chinatown in Soho, so how about another one in the Isle of Dogs, which has a lot of Chinese residents? China, of course, has the world's best cycleway network. The fifth example is that detailed cycleway design should respond to the landscape character assessments for which many landscape architects are commissioned. To summarise, I suggest a cycle network plan that uses landscape urbanism layers to create context-sensitive cycleways. We should work with transport engineers to plan and design a better, more popular, cheaper transport network. You can imagine the urban landscape billowing across the cycleways in a multi-objective landscape urbanism sandwich. It would let cyclists appreciate and discover the urban landscape while getting from A to B. 
cycle planning should respect the single agreed law of landscape architecture. Consult the genius of the place is the old name for context-sensitive design.